actually shut them down. That's how you revive this constitutional republic. I won't be using last year's budget as the baseline, which is based on the prior year's budget, which is based on the years before's budget before that. No. We're going to use zero as our baseline and ask what's actually necessary. Zero-based budgeting. That's how I run my businesses. That's how I'm going to run the federal government. And that's how we're going to tackle the $34 trillion national debt crisis that we have right now while draining the swamp in the process. If I can't work for you for more than eight years, which is a good thing, neither should any of those federal bureaucrats reporting into me either. Eight-year term limits for the bureaucracy instead of civil service protections. This is how you drain the swamp. So that's number one on the list. The people we elect to run the government should run the government. And number two is, their sole moral duty is to the citizens of this nation, not another one. I'm not going to be forking over $200 billion more of your taxpayer money to places like Ukraine so some kleptocrat can buy a bigger house. No, I'm not doing that. And you're welcome. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to use our own military to secure our own southern border and our northern border, too. That's what it means to stand for the rule of law and protect our borders in this country. I will end birthright citizenship for the kids of illegals. It does not apply to them. I mean, a president who swears an oath to the Constitution who understands that. I'm not going to send your money to federal sanctuary cities to pay for breaking the rule of law right here at home in our own country. Not just build the wall, build both walls. Use our military to secure it. Don't give foreign aid willy-nilly to Central America and Mexico when they're failing to block their own borders from Venezuela and the southern border of Texas. Get that down, our border crisis under control. And yes, I'll go further and address the question that other Republican candidates duck. For anybody who's in this country illegally, yes, we will return them to their country of origin, period. That's what it means to stand for the rule of law in the United States of America. That's not too much to ask. The people we elect to run the government should run the government. And the moral duty they owe is to the citizens of this nation, not another one. Now the fact that that's controversial, the fact that they will call me, it's not even just controversial, they'll say it's radical. It's characters on CNN will say it is dangerous that they're shaking to hear me say these things. It tells you everything about what's broken with our state of both parties in the United States right now. And Donald Trump, he went with the right intentions on a lot of these things, but they duped him, actually. They do. They say, Mr. President, you can't fire those federal bureaucrats because of civil service protections. Well, read the law. Those civil service protections do not apply to mass firings. And mass firings are absolutely what I am bringing to the D.C. bureaucracy. They told him, Mr. President, you need a constitutional amendment to end birthright citizenship, which has been a codified part of our Constitution since the 14th Amendment. Read the 14th Amendment. The opening words are clear. It says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens. Those extra words mean it does not apply to the kids of illegals who are not subject to the jurisdiction in the same way. They told Mr. President, how could we? We can't do the mass deportations that you might have wanted to do because we only have 6,000 ICE agents and this is going to require more funding through Congress. Read the law. 287G in the law allows you right now to serve those warrants via local law enforcement of whom there's a million in the country that put a man on the moon can then absolutely get this done. And so they duped him. They're not going to dupe me in the same way. It takes a president now who, yes, is an outsider, is a businessman. I'm not a politician. I'm a businessman. I built multi-billion dollar companies. Somebody who's willing to break things. Shatter glass when necessary. Trump brought that, I bring that on steroids. But it's also going to take a president who knows and deeply understands the law and the Constitution in this country. And those two things don't usually go together. Right? You'll have the academic legal type over here, you'll have the businessman type over here, the entrepreneur type, but those two things don't usually go together. 
And that's why I'm in this race. That's why we're in this race. It's our faith that leads us to this journey, actually. Our faith teaches us there's one true God, and he puts us here for a purpose. And it's our moral duty to realize that purpose. That God gives every one of us our own unique God-given gifts. But it is our job to use those gifts to do what is right in the short time that we are given. That's why I'm in this race. I think our country and the future of our country depends on whether or not we get it right right now. If our kids are in high school before we get this right, I don't think we have a country left. If the interest payments on our national debt become the largest line item in our federal budget, we're toast, we're quicksand. I don't think we have a country left. People ask me, can you do this in 2028 if it doesn't work out this time? That works for me. I don't have to do this at all. Works for our, our kids to be a little bit older. It might even be more convenient for us. This is about us. It's about this country. We're skating on thin ice. And I'm worried this year. And I talked about this the last week or so. It's made some people upset that I've said so. It made Donald Trump upset. But it's the truth. And sometimes the truth hurts. So I'm going to share it with you. I think we're walking into a trap right now. We're being led into a trap. If you think they're going to let this man get anywhere near the White House again, I want you to open your eyes. These people will stop at nothing. At this point, it is increasingly clear. They will stop at nothing to keep Donald J. Trump out of power. I've done everything I can to push back against this. It's disgusting. I found a Supreme Court amicus brief earlier this week laying out the best legal arguments for why the U.S. Supreme Court needed to overturn Colorado Supreme Court's disastrous decision to keep him off the ballot. I did that out of my sense of duty to this country because to be really honest with you, I'm not sure his legal team is going to make those arguments. And they need to be heard by the Supreme Court to get this right. I've done everything in my power to do this right. But at a certain point... We have to open our eyes. They are selling us the rope today that they will use to hang us tomorrow. They want to narrow this down to a two-horse race between Donald Trump and a puppet who they can control. To be really frank with you, that puppet has a name. Her name is Nikki Haley. That's what it is. It's what's going on hiding in plain sight. Eliminate Trump and then trot Nikki into the White House. That's what's going on right now. It's hiding in plain sight. Very people who are paid to keep Donald Trump off the ballot Look at who they're writing their checks to is none other than Nikki Haley in our own party. That's the game. So are we going to look back a year from now and say we're shocked that that happened? Is that what we'll say? Or we look back and say that how did we see that coming and why did we walk into that trap? Last time it was a man-made pandemic in a rigged election. This time they're going to stop at nothing. And so we love the man because he got this fight started, but now it is our job to finish it. Because America First didn't start in 2016. It started in 1776. And we owe it to our founding fathers and to this country to make sure we have another 250 years and then some still left. And so I'm asking you to do the right thing tomorrow night. The future of our country hangs in the balance of what happens starting here tomorrow night in Iowa. It's going to be cold. I know that. I know that. Speak the truth. It's not, I mean, I think sometimes they overblow this stuff a little bit, but windy, cold. It's not that you all haven't seen before. George Washington did not complain about the weather when he crossed the Delaware, okay? We live in our own 1776 moment right now. And so I'm asking you to not only come out, I'm asking for your vote at that Iowa caucus. I'm asking you tomorrow morning, later tonight, between now and the time you go, to reach 10 people who aren't in this room, who couldn't be here tonight, and tell them what we're talking about tonight. Open their eyes if they have their heads stuck in the snow as well. Because I think that that's what's happened to a lot of our party. We believe what we wish to be true rather than accept what actually is true. And it's just like the federal government. They don't want to give you the truth because they think the public can't handle it. We the people can't handle the truth. We demand the truth. We require the truth. And that's what I'm giving you right now. So open your eyes, skate to where this puck is going, 
And that's how we're going to get this country back. So if you all do your part, Apoorva and I, we are going to do ours. We will stop at no effort for this country. We've got 390 events just like this. It's more than every other candidate, all of them combined. We're going to work as hard for this country and harder than even we have in this campaign. If you do your part, we will do ours to make sure, not in some fake politician way, but in a true way to make sure that our country's best days are actually still ahead of us. Thank you for coming out tonight, guys. God bless you and your families, and I'm going to open this up and, and have a conversation with you all. Thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, microphone there, good. Sir, we'll start right, right there with you. Perfect. Very well. Thank you for coming tonight. I just want to make a comment that I've had a lot of text from Nikki Haley. I've seen you twice now. And thank you for making that effort to come out here. Thank you. Uh, it comes down for me. I have, I'm, I have it between you and his hands. I haven't decided. I'm the last second guy, I guess. How do you differentiate yourself from this hands? Sure. So I'd say, I'd say a few things. I think he's actually been a good governor in Florida. I've gotten to know him through this process, and I think he's a decent man, and he has a decent family. Those are things I'll say right out of the gate. A number of his endorsers at this late phase of the race, Steve Holt, one of your strongest constitutional conservatives in this state, have come in our direction, has switched at this last late hour. Not because they have anything bad to say about him, but because they realize that their values are more closely aligned with mine, which are most closely aligned with the Constitution. Two differences between me and Ron. One is Ron is a politician. I'm a businessman. I do think it's going to take a businessman. I think there's one important and unfortunate consequence of that. I think he's unable to share and stand for many of his true convictions because money is the mother's built of politics. I don't think he would actually tell you that he is naturally in favor of eminent domain for this CO2 pipeline. Except for the fact that the same donor establishment that controls half the state, including many people, including the governor of the state, Mr. Norston, are under the control of many of those same donors. It's not a slight on any one person, it's just how the game is played and how it works. So that's why the Des Moines Register reports that he is in favor of eminent domain for this CO2 pipeline. I think the biggest difference ideologically between me and Ron, though, is, you know, I'm a businessman, he's a politician. I think he's, even though his heart may be in the right place on certain of these issues, Ukraine, the CO2 pipeline, really speaking the truth about climate change, He's a little bit constrained by what his donors allow him to say. It's not his fault, it's just the way the system is made. But I think we have a deeper ideological difference as well when it comes to an actual commitment to the Constitution, regardless of when it's convenient or not. I believe in free speech, especially for those who disagree with me. I think what many of those college students are saying, chanting, death to Israel on those college campuses, is disgusting. It's offensive. It's in, what Hamas did, Israel was subhuman and medieval and immoral. And so to say in the wake of that death to Israel on a college campus, it's disgusting. But I still believe they have the right to say it. In Ron DeSantis' case, he had no problem banning the student groups that were saying it. It didn't take even a matter of days to just say they had to disband those student groups, saying that that constituted material support for a terrorist organization. Are they writing checks and sending munitions? No, they were tweeting. I think it's a problem in our country. You see, that the same protester came to Ron's event and actually came to mine two nights ago. It turns out it was the same group. It's a left-wing group that's been storming a lot of these events. When they came to Ron's event, I think, I mean, the kid, is, the kid looks like he was lost, but he might be 19, 20 years old. He was tackled by three people and taken out. In my case, I gave him the mic. No, he had a deal. You get to speak for 60 seconds. You be respectful. You treat everybody else the same way. Fine, you get to speak the mind. You get to get the mic and you get to speak. I think it's just a fundamentally different approach where I believe Ron and I see some of the same risks. And he read my first book, Woke Inc., and I think that guided, I was proud that that guided some of what he tried to get done in Florida. But I think Ron views it, if you ask me a question, so I'll, I'll tell you what I believe is true. I think he views it as a game of whack-a-mole. Right? You got some wokeism here, got that down over there. Got some transgenderism popping up here, okay, we'll take care of that. Climatism, okay, well, that's kind of a weird thing we need to defend against. COVID is a good job against COVID. COVID is a whack that down. 
And I see all of these things as a symptom of a deeper void in our country. These are symptoms of a deeper cancer. A loss of purpose and meaning and identity in the United States of America. And I think the way we win isn't just by playing whack-a-mole. We dilute the poison to irrelevance by offering a vision of our national identity, answering what we actually stand for. That's how we dilute the woke poison to irrelevance. And one of those things we stand for is the U.S. Constitution, which guarantees you religious liberty and freedom of speech. And if you're going to swear oath to the Constitution, I have an obligation to you and to this country and to our founding fathers to keep that oath to the Constitution, not to just playing my short-term game of whack-a-mole. So that was somewhat of an abstract answer to your question, but I think it goes to the foundational difference between Ron DeSantis and myself. If you want to defeat the woke and bury them in the ground, but woke 2.0 just pops up over here, but you celebrate that you got 1.0 done, Ron DeSantis might arguably be a better candidate. I think if you want to understand what that is that you just buried, like actually deeply understand it, and see it as a symptom of the loss of our national identity and offer a vision of who we are as Americans to lead an entire nation, including that 19-year-old kid who was tackled as a vet. I looked in the same kid's eyes the next day. What I see is a kid who's against us. I see a kid who was lost, a little psychologically deranged, in his own way crying out for help at a moment where faith and family and patriotism and hard work have disappeared, has subscribed to this new religion called climate. It's our job as leaders to lead that next generation, not from something, but to something. That's our job. And I think that that's fundamentally might be the difference between what we need in a governor and what we need in a president right now. And I think right now, we need, it's going to be a role for everybody to make a difference in this country. I think the way this is going to go is Ron is going to continue being an excellent governor in the state of Florida. I think he's going to be an important part of reviving this country. But when it comes to the presidency right now, we need a president who stands for the right policies, but also a president who revives our national character, who answers who we are. I'm America first, but to put America first, we have to rediscover what America is. And that's the standard I want you to hold me to as your next president. Is I think there's no, I can say this much with confidence, there's nobody else in this race that has a deeper understanding of and commitment to the U.S. Constitution than I do. And if we're going to swear an oath to that Constitution, you deserve a president who will finally, at long last, keep it. That's what I ask you Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go there and then we'll come here. Thank you. Very is, if you do not win the nomination, and I hope you do, but if you do not, would you accept the vice presidency, someone would ask you. So you, let's just assume that would be Donald Trump in that scenario you're thinking? Anybody. Okay. For Nikki Haley, I'd give a flat no. I would just be a flat no. Right? For, for Donald Trump, I have people ask me this question enough times, and so I'll tell you what my answer has been, and I'm like, I'll click a layer deeper, because I have a chance to think about it a little bit more. For Donald Trump, I mean, look, I've, I've enjoyed getting a lot of questions in the last few weeks where a number of people said they came in hoping that I would be Trump's vice president. They left asking if I would make Trump my vice president, which, yeah, I think is not a bad role for him, actually. Not that that's a demotion, but that that's almost an emeritus role. I can rely on him as an advisor. One way or another, I expect to rely on him as, a, rely on him as an advisor. So I expect to be your next president. That's why I'm in this. I'm going to be best positioned to lead this nation from the front. But, you know, campaigns founded on truth, and so, you know, now people have asked me this question. I'm not a plan B person, so I can't really tell you my brain doesn't function that way. But I can tell you this. I need to know, I mean, I, for the same reason I gave you a flat note to Nikki, I need to know that Trump and I were on the same page on a few things. Are you serious about ending the war in Ukraine, or is that just a talking point about a 24-hour deal that you won't say what it is? Are you serious about actually ending the federal subsidies for a carbon capture pipeline, bending the knee to a climate change cult, and saying no to donor money, including from the likes of Bruce Rastetter, if that's necessary, to stand for what's right? Will we stop sending these subsidies to the carbon capture pipeline, making its way across half the state? Are we actually going to follow through and pardon on day one 
every peaceful January 6th protester, even if it's politically inconvenient, rather than throwing them under the bus as part of some other project? Are we actually going to strip pharmaceutical companies? Admit that Operation Warp Speed wasn't what we thought it should have been, and that we can at least acknowledge and learn from that to say that we will strip pharmaceutical companies of their special liability exemptions so that there actually can be justice where there has been injury. Like, are we serious about these things? Are we going to build that new building for the FBI? Because if so, I'm not in. If we're really going to get serious about shutting it down, we can have that conversation. And so I don't have the answers to those questions right now, but those would be minimal conditions for me to even entertain having that conversation. But if that's where we are, and that's what the people of this country want, there's a better way to do this, and I'm standing right here. I'll have your little ballot tomorrow night, circle my name. We don't have to do the conditions. We can just get this right through the front door. That's why I'm in this race. And so I'm going to do whatever is right for this country. You have my word on that. We're, we, this country has been kind enough to us. We've lived an American dream that my parents never imagined possible when they came to this country 40 years ago in search of opportunity. I founded multi-billion dollar companies. I did it while marrying a poor girl, raising our two sons, following our faith in God. That's the American dream. I'm worried that American dream isn't going to exist for our kids and their generation. That's why we're doing this. I've had all the success I need as a capitalist. This next phase of our life, our career, our journey is about recreating that country so we can pass that on to the next generation. I'll do that as the floor sweeper at the White House if I have to. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be at the White House. There's many ways to change this country, but I believe that what this country requires is a president who knows and deeply understands the law and the Constitution, but not just as a legal scholar pontificating about it. And I've written three books in the last couple of years, and I know what that looks like, and that's important. But somebody who can also execute that. And I think that's going to take a skilled businessman with energy and fresh legs to see this through. And so I've gotten that vice president question probably enough times we get to the eve of the Iowa caucus tomorrow night it is, I guess I had a chance to reflect on it. I have a long list of conditions, so long that it would just remind me of why I actually just needed to be the president to actually get the darn thing done. So that might answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, so I was listening to Capitalist Punishment. Oh, thank you. Well, well I was snow blowing, so I asked our library to get Woke Inc. on the audio. Have you read Woke Inc. yet? I have not. Oh, Woke Inc. is supposed to come before Capitalist Punishment. They got it, but they didn't tell me they got this one third on the waiting list. But they had one in the back, so I have it here to actually read, and I'd like you to sign it before we leave. I will. But I have a couple of questions for you. Piggybacking off of his, um, I've been watching your arch since this summer. Um, as the youngest person to run as a Republican and a businessman, not a politician. And that's one of the reasons I liked Trump eight years ago, is because he's not a politician, or he wasn't. Um, someone say, you don't have the connections in Washington, so how do you respond to that? And then... What would you, and I'll ask for a name, but what would you be looking for in your VP mm -hmm. um, as a running mate? And then the second part of my question is, Iowa is now a constitutional state, carry state. What are you going to do to, <laughs> some of these liberal states are passing non-common sense gun laws. How are you going to fortify my two-way rights? I think constitutional carry should be the law of the land. That's an easy one. I've said that since I speak to the NRA this summer. The Second Amendment is the one amendment that protects all of the others, actually. People miss that. It's not about hunting and sport fishing, sport shooting. It's not what it's about. I have other hobbies. It's not that. I mean, that's really, you know, we enjoy going to the shooting range as much as the next guy, but it's not about the hobby of it. Right. It's about the First Amendment and the Fifth Amendment and every other amendment that the Second Amendment is required to actually protect. China and Iran claim to offer you Second Amendment rights. They claim to offer your constitutional rights. But they don't, offer, they don't actually give them to you because there is no Second Amendment. Black Americans didn't enjoy their civil rights in this country after the Civil War until their Second Amendment rights were secured. Actually, one of the worst Supreme Court cases we've ever had, the Dred Scott case, which said that black Americans could not be citizens, the reason the Supreme Court justice gave Justice Tani at the time was that that would then allow black Americans to own guns. So civil rights and Second Amendment rights have always been two sides of the same coin. So that's where I'm going to protect your Second Amendment rights, and that's the answer to, to that question. Now, 
to your deeper question about you know who, uh, what connections in Washington D.C. You're right. I mean, well, I mean, see, the truth is, I've been a successful businessman. I wrote Woke King. We actually actually do have a lot of connections in Washington D.C. I, I don't know if that's good, actually, because I'm looking for mostly disconnecting them, right? I got my. I know. I know who's plugged in. I'm mostly unplugging it out of there. And actually, it's a much more honest form of connection because you can kind of see it as a game for what it is. You're not a pawn in the game. It's almost like you're almost a player of the game coming in from the outside. But Donald Trump had some element of that as well. And that's. I, I think we would know our way around just fine. And I think that having the benefit, it's like if you stand on the table at that bar, you can actually see the whole room. If you're one of the players sitting in the seats, it doesn't, you know, you don't actually have the whole perspective of what's actually that going on. What would I look for in a vice president? I'm looking for competence, and I'm looking for somebody who can be as ideological as I am in my opposition to the administrative state. Somebody who's going to be a partner in cutting through that bureaucracy and shaving it down, raising it to the ground, slashing and burning the apparatus itself. So this guy, unfortunately, can't do it. He's become a friend. But I think he'd be great. If it weren't for one fact, he's not quite a natural-born citizen. This is Elon Musk. I think he'd be excellent. He shares my view of it. Actually, Steve, I didn't tell you this, but he tweeted something yesterday. And I just happened to go to your uh, Twitter page. And your pinned tweet is hilarious. He says, he says three great African-Americans. Clarence Thomas, Thomas Sowell, and Elon Musk. <laughs> but anyway, he's in, probably he's in South Africa. So he was, he was born, native born in South Africa. So he's not, he's not eligible as a natural born citizen. But it's got to be somebody like that, that level of competence. Draw that contrast to the current vice president we have. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's really, I mean, you got, the, the, Kamala Harris is the person in charge of AI policy right now. Think about that. AI policy in the White House is run by a woman who is challenged, let's just say, with competence. I can't think of a more dangerous threat to the future of humanity than to put Kamala Harris in charge of AI policy for the U.S. If you're going to put someone in charge of AI policy, the minimum should be you should at least be able to spell AI. And I don't think, I don't think that's actually quite the case with the current vice president. And so for me, when I say competence, whatever I'm going to put my vice president in charge of, they're at least going to be able to spell it. But Elon Musk, I think, sets a pretty high standard, but that's what I'm, that's the standard I'm going to use to pick somebody who's an executive but with competence and shares my ability to actually cut through that deep state. And, and let's be honest with you, that's the role of a vice president, to be the president. That's the top job of a vice president. Somebody who's going to be, you have to honestly look yourself in the mirror and believe they could actually have a chance of being better than you at doing the job, God forbid, should that day come. And we have a tradition in this country that's been followed, I think, pretty assiduously in recent history of putting a potted plant in the role because you have people who are afraid of being overshadowed. Well, actually what it is, it's the insurance policy, but you want the insurance policy to pay out and give you what the people signed up for. And so I'm going to pick somebody who I believe has a fighting chance of being better than I am at the role rather than putting a potted plant in there for fear of being overshadowed. And that might be a difference between me and, and, and certain other people who are running for U.S. president how I think about that role. So, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Is it working? Okay. Uh, my name is Travis. I'm from Duke. Thank you for coming. Um, I'll be honest. Truth. I'm a Trump supporter. I love a lot of stuff that you have. As of right now, you are. As of right now, I have left. Yes. However, I like a lot of stuff you have to say. My question is, what makes you think that what happened to Trump it's not going to happen to you, and how do you plan on tackling that? Sure. I mean, some of us feel that this is a, a, a battle that we have to finish with the deep state. Well, not the deep state, but with the left and everything. I'm not saying it's both like that. The deep state and the left are yeah. two sides of the same coin. But if we couldn't get Trump back, what makes you think we'll get anybody else back? Yeah. So they don't have on him what they have on me. Let's just, let's just get straight to that right now. We're in the middle of a war in this country, as I said. It's a war. There's no middle ground here. Either you believe in merit or you believe in group quotas. Either you believe in free speech or you believe in censorship. Either you believe in American exceptionalism 
or do you believe in apologizing for who we are? There's no middle ground here. If you're in that war, I think we need a commander-in-chief, a general, to lead us to victory now, who is not yet wounded in that war. Somebody with fresh legs. Pick the general who's actually going to lead us to victory. If I was 80 years old and wounded four times over, I wouldn't tell you to vote for me either. I think you also get to be an outsider once. Trump was the outsider, I think I'm closer to Trump in 2016 than Trump today is to Trump in 2016, actually. Except with the learnings of those four years to get that head start and actually learn from it. And so there is a reason I'm the only candidate in this race who can tell you certain things. I mean, Steve King was going to go endorse Donald Trump. All Donald Trump needed to do was to actually take a position on the carbon capture pipeline, but he couldn't do it. And I think there are certain constraints you talk about connections in Washington, D.C. At a certain point, you become connected. And you, then it's time to get somebody else new in. Fresh blood. When I get to that point, get me the heck out of there, too. We'll drop the mic and pass it on to the next guy. But right now, I'm the outsider in this race. Now, I think that this system's not going to let him get there. But I got two things. One is they don't have on me what they have on him. And number two is I have a deep understanding of the law and the Constitution of this country. And I think you need that to be able to not be duped swallowed whole by that same system. You strike the swamp, the swamp strikes back, no doubt about it. But if you wanted to actually defeat it, you've got to understand the law and the Constitution deeply. And I think I bring that in a way that nobody else who's actually been the president for a long time really has brought to the table. Even George Bush was a problem, really, for the people underneath him. I think we require a president, I mean, the current president, I don't sit here bashing Joe Biden, it's a waste of time, really. He's not really even the president of the United States. He's a puppet for the managerial class. This is this deep state that we actually need to shut down. So the way I think about it is we love the man. Because he got this fight started. But it is our job and my duty now to finish it. He rolled over that log. We saw what crawled out. I'm bringing the pesticide. That's what it's going to take to actually shut down the deep state. When I'm the only person... Without exception, in this race, who can tell you, I'll strip vaccine manufacturers of liability exemptions because it's the right thing to do. That I'm opposed to the CO2 pipeline. That I'm a part of peaceful J6 protesters. That the climate change agenda is a hoax. That Ronald McDaniel needs to get the heck out of our house and resign as the failed chairwoman of the RNC. Why am I the only person who can tell you these things, look you in the eye, and tell you that right now? That's right. And so if you want somebody who's actually going to go in there and speak truth to power, vote for the one candidate who's actually speaking the truth to you. And so for the sake of this country and every one of us in it, including Trump himself, maybe especially Trump himself, I'm actually asking you to vote for me tomorrow night at the caucus. And we will honor him and his legacy because it's the right thing to do for the country but I'm asking you to do the right thing for our country and not fall into the trap that they have laid for us. Because if not, exactly what it's going to go. It's going to be the spring of the summer. It's going to be him and the puppet. They're going to knock him out, trot their puppet in. I have a high degree of confidence. I mean, you can just see it hiding in plain sight. With all respect, sir, I think you owe it to this country to make sure that we don't fall into that trap, and that's why I'm asking for your vote. So thank you. I appreciate the candor. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much for coming out today. Um, so my question is, I would like to know your stance on abortion. Yes. I'll give you a clear answer. I'm pro-life. Unborn life is life, and we have to protect it. That's, that's, that's the bottom line. When I talk about zero-based budgeting, this is part of that. We should not be using federal taxpayer dollars to fund Planned Parenthood. Right? And why haven't we done it? Because we got so much in that budget, it almost becomes hard to extricate something one by one. But if you start with zero as the baseline, literally zero, and ask what's necessary for the federal government to spend money on, Planned Parenthood definitely is not on the list. So it's always shutting down the deep state and actually going to zero-based budgeting. Actually do it. You know, I'm not going to make Javier Malay look like a moderate by my first three months in office. I'll tell you that. That's also how we root out a lot of the immorality that's written into our federal code as well. Now I'm going to 
give us some self-reflection here. I don't think our pro-life movement has done a good enough job of walking the walk when it comes to being pro-life. I think we've got to level up and actually stand even more strongly for our principles. More access to crisis pregnancy care. More access and ease of access to adoption. Access to child care on reasonable terms. And I'll give you one speaking as a man on this. I think this is a winner for us this year. And I'm going to speak to you as your candidate in the general election. I think that we need to codify in the law, and we should favor as a party codifying in the law greater sexual responsibility for men, specifically. If a woman brings a child to term, she should, at her option, be able to make the man the principal responsible financial party both for her and for the child as long as it's confirmed with a genetic paternity test, which we have today that we didn't have 40 years ago. That's how you walk the walk when it comes to being pro-life. So now, it's not about men's rights versus women's rights, which is how the left has managed to frame it. It's about human rights. We're all in this together. And I'll tell you what, I, I've talked to the other side of one experience I've had. I'll bring up the case of a pregnant woman who was assaulted. The unborn child died as a result. I haven't met one person in this country who believes that that lawbreaker doesn't deserve liability for that death. And I don't think you're, anybody in this room is going to find one either. So that says we share those same pro-life instincts in common. But maybe it's that we haven't done a good enough job of actually standing up for our pro-life principles and that gives you a sense of how I'm going to lead this country. I'm going to unite this country not by compromising on our principles, but by actually standing for the principles that unite us as Americans. And that's how we're actually going to revive this country without actually betraying who we really are or why we bothered to do it in the first place. Thank you. I appreciate that question. I'll take one or two last questions. Hi. Uh, my name is Greg. Uh, I've seen you multiple times here in the youth, and then a uh, lot of podcasts, TV, campus, etc. What I have seen a lot of is we're in Iowa. I grew up on a farm. A lot of people are related to farmers or in the business. Do you have a general outline for the farm program and subsidies and things like that? I would say broad strokes. For now, if it ain't broke, we don't need to fix it. What we do need to fix is the private property right protection for farmers. Right? Once they can seize your land, that's the ballgame. And by the way, if they can seize your land and take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, next step is your cow. Really, leave a $50 check in your mailbox. They've had their eye on that for a long time, your car, or your tractor, or your combustion engine vehicle, or your gas stove. So that's, that's one of the issues where I've been most distinctly focused versus others. Certain types of farmers, that this affects the Iowans, corn farmers in Iowa. I favor the renewable fuel standard because of actually a market-based justification for it. I generally don't like government picking favorites in different industries. But the problem is the government did pick favorites because if the oil industry lobbied to get no consumer choice at the pump, then that distorted the market. So what you see is where you have true consumer choice at the pump. You're all, you're, you're all like, like you're familiar with this, ethanol comes from wild corn. There's a blend in a certain amount of that that's in fuel, and there's a law, the Renewable Fuel Standard, the RFS, that says there's a minimal amount of ethanol that has to be in that fuel, and that's controversial sometimes. And in the, the reason why that ends up being in the law is because Iowa lobbyists, you know, and whatever say that we need that for Iowa's economy, and presidential candidates come through here every four years and, you know, do what they need to do to tell you what you want to hear. I love Iowa farmers. I love Iowa corn farmers, but that's not my reason for supporting the RFS. My reason for supporting the RFS is actually a market-based justification, which is that in the few areas where you do have true consumer choice at the pump, say in Wichita, Kansas, they, they happen to, you see consumers on their own choosing a higher blend of ethanol in the fuel than is the minimum in the renewable fuel standard. Why? Because it's cheaper and they know it's made in America. But we don't have true consumer choice at the pump because the oil industry lobbied to keep ethanol out, which is a different form of crony capitalism. So the reason I favor the RFS is as a second best alternative that's still the next best market based way of thinking. So that at least gives you a sense for how I think. Try to be principled but also practical at the same time. And that'd be the hybrid through which we actually 
drive our farming and ag policy, acknowledging that food security is national security. In an era of where we're at high risk of conflict than we've ever been, self-sustenance in the United States without requiring it, going out and out of the Black Sea or wherever else, is now more important than ever. And so standing for the backbone of the people who produce that food is also a vital national and economic security for the United States as well. And that's how I would lead. So thank you, Pastor. I appreciate it. We'll have time for one last question. So we'll give you the final word. Yeah, so um, uh, people my age were going through this time where we, had, we see the middle class quickly, rapidly declining to the point where our next paycheck could be we're just standing in line at the food bank. What is your plan to deter that so we're not ending up like a country like Norway? Yeah. Or worse. You see a lot of cities across this country. You don't have to travel to the third world anymore to actually travel and see the third world. I've been to Kensington, in the middle of the inner city of Philadelphia, I've been to the south side of Chicago. They're giving out crack pipes and needles in the name of aid programs. See, some of you guys find some of those videos of my trip to Kensington. It's unbelievable. You, you can't make this stuff up. People actually have posted this, and people haven't traveled to other parts of the inner city and certain parts of the country. They thought we had paid actors in the background. They no, 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 this is literally, this is the state of destitution in the United States of America. So one of the top things I'm going to be able to do, I'm a CEO, for me this is more second nature of how to grow the economy. You want to grow the economy, you want to pay down the national debt at the same time, here's how we're going to do it. First is we have $34 trillion in national debt. That's $200,000 of debt on your shoulders that you didn't sign up for. How do we pay that down without cutting Social Security or Medicare or veterans' benefits? That's the key question. Very practical plan to do it that also grows the economy. Get the oil and natural gas out from underneath our ground and sell it. Use that to buy down $8 trillion of our national debt. That's the first step. Second is... Top obstacle to most small businesses growing right now is finding new people to staff those open positions. Well, stop paying people more money to stay at home instead of to go to work. That's how you grow this economy. Gut the Federal Reserve, which has been fundamentally hostile to economic growth in this country. Restore a single mandate for the U.S. Fed. Stabilize the dollar as a unit of measurement. Peg it to something real, something true. Commodities. Gold, silver, nickel, agricultural, and farm commodities. Once you stabilize the dollar, you actually get great economic growth in this country. Slash and burn the federal bureaucracy apparatus. Rescind the unconstitutional federal regulations that are acting like a wet blanket on the U.S. economy that's constrained the supply of housing, for example, which jacks up the cost of housing. Well, how do we increase the supply? A lot of those land use restrictions or those EPA regulations, roll them back. That increases new home construction. That increases the supply, brings down the cost, grows this economy. So we think about how we do this. Increase the supply of everything. Increase the supply of energy. Strip back the regulation so we can drill, frack, burn coal, embrace nuclear. Increase the supply of housing. How? Get rid of the regulations that are stopping new home construction in this country. Increase the supply of labor. How? Stop paying people more to stay at home instead of to go to work. That's how we grow this economy. And by the end of my first term... I think we will be darn close to, if not in excess, of 5% GDP growth in this country. And you know what? Young people tend to be more proud of a country when they're making more money in that country. It takes a CEO of the White House to get this job done. For me, this is second nature. All we've got to do is step up and get there. Shut down the deep state. Use our own money to protect our own citizens. That's the whole premise of this candidacy. The promises I make are the promises that I will keep. My first legislative agenda is going to be to secure our elections in this country with single-day voting on Election Day as a national holiday, with paper ballots, government-issued voter ID to match the voter file, and yes, English as the sole language that appears on a ballot. It's not controversial, it's common sense. That's what we need to get done to secure elections in this country. So the promises I make, from the economy to the border to securing our elections, 
There's a lot else. I haven't promised you comprehensive health care reform or repeal and replace Obamacare without a clear alternative vision, especially when it has to go through the morass of Congress. I'd like to do that, but I'm not going to promise it to you. But the things I have promised you, these are the promises I will keep, and these are the promises we need an ex-president to keep before to have a country left at the end of it. Stand for truth. I've given you a promise. That's what I'm going to keep as your next president. And if we get this done, then we don't have to anymore be this nation in decline that we've become. We don't have to be at the end of the ancient Roman Empire. I think what George Washington would say if you were in this room with us right now is that as a nation, we're really just a little young now. Going through our own adolescence. Figuring out who we're going to be when we grow up. And when you view it that way, it makes sense again, actually. You go through your adolescence, you go through that identity crisis. You lose your way a little bit. You do some stupid things. But we are stronger for it when we get to our adulthood on the other side. So no, I don't think we have to be that nation in decline. I think we still can be a nation in our ascent. I'm not going to be the guy who walks in here and tells you that it's morning in America right now, because it is not. But it can be. I won't tell you that the American dream is alive and well right now. It is not. It's alive and hanging on for life support. But it can be. It can be if we make it so. And that's why we're here. This system isn't made for people like us to do it. Coming in from the outside. From the next generation. Saying the things even in the Republican Party that you're not supposed to say. Even if you were the one time outsider. The system isn't made for it. But they don't get to decide. It's up to you. Every one of you, I want 30 minutes of your time. I'm asking you for your vote tomorrow night at the Iowa caucus. And I am further asking you to take the time between now and then to tell 10 people, 10 patriots who care about this country, what we talked about tonight, and have them come to on a cold day. And if you all do your part, our family and I, we will do ours to make sure we still look our kids in the eye and mean it when we tell them the United States of America is still the nation where no matter who you are or where your parents came from or what your skin color is, that you do get ahead in this country with your own hard work, your own commitment, your own dedication. And that you know what? You are free to speak your mind at every step of the way. That is the American dream. That is what we are running to. And with your help, that is what we will revive to save this great country. Thank you. God bless you and your families, and may God bless our United States.